Dr. Lucendi Bobo, strategist. I come from Uganda and I am making this presentation on behalf of Amaria Tech Foundation, um, an organization that I founded uh, to solve the problems that uh, were shared by Tracy. And uh, we've been working since 2020. I'll be sharing more about Amaria Tech as we move on. But um, the purpose of our talk today is to help you understand how Ugandan youth lead community initiatives to combat climate change, uh, to help you recognize the critical role of the youth, uh, the Ugandan youth and their minds, and the, how they are approaching the whole, uh, the whole idea of climate change, how they are tackling the climate-related issues that we are facing. And then also uh, to give you a chance to learn from our journey celebrate with us some of our achievements and discuss ways we can collaborate together to um, to do more of the work that we do. So by the end of my presentation, uh, you'll be able to learn why Ugandan youth are key players in the climate action movement. Uh, you'll also be able to gain insights into the effective methods that support and elevate young climate leaders in Uganda, but above all, you will be inspired by the tangible examples of environmental sustainability driven by Uganda's youth. So what I'm going to be sharing with you uh, will be a journey and a story, but I'll be starting by sharing with you about my beautiful country, Uganda. Um, so I don't know uh, how many of you have ever been to Uganda, but I presented this with assumption that majority of you have never been to Uganda. so. I would love to take this beautiful opportunity, obviously, to start by sharing with you about my beautiful country, Uganda. So Uganda is called the Pearl of Africa. Uh, in the middle of my slide, you see that beautiful pearl. It's a country that is hidden somewhere in Africa, but it's it's the pearl, and it is um, it was named by Winston Ch Churchill um, in 1908 as the Pearl of Africa because of its beauty the diverse landscape and the abundant lifestyle. I think uh, Rasmus will be able to share with us some of those later. But for those that come to Uganda, talk about the beauty of the country. And I'm starting by sharing this because I also want to share with you the climate reality and how it has affected this beautiful pearl, a place that was once abundant with life, like wildlife, a place that was once abundant with vegetation, now moving to a place that is almost unrecognized. But anyway, this is my beautiful country, Uganda. And we've all heard about the River Nile. The River Nile serves and passes through very many countries in Africa. And the source of River Nile is right here in Uganda on Lake Victoria, which is still the largest freshwater source here in Uganda. So everything, we literally, take care of most of the countries that are along that line, South, South Sudan, Egypt, ETC, up to, look, the Nile doesn't go through Kenya, but yes, Lake Victoria uh, is in Kenya and Tanzania also, the Lake Victoria that we have, which is really big, and it feeds and takes care of people in Kenya, in Tanzania, and even Rwanda, it extends up to Rwanda. So this is uh, my beautiful country. And then another thing is that half of the world's remaining gorilla, mountain gorillas are from Uganda. So if you ever get time, please come and check out our beautiful gorillas. They are amazing and we take very good care of them and we make sure that they live in nature and they are not disrupted, they're not in, not in the zoos. That's why the weather and the climate is very important for them to continue to live in the wild and give tourists an opportunity to come and, and have an experience with them. So, for those who, okay, sorry, I've just realized I've not been putting my slides here. So, um, well, I don't know, but most people say that Ugandans are very hospitable, and it's true. Uh, we Ugandans have a very good hospitality. They are very welcoming. Um, we know how to really welcome people, but also among our communities, we know how to live with one another since... Uh, way back then in Uganda, when you're going to visit your relative or friends, you don't need to call them and say, hey, I'm coming over to your place, wait for me. In Uganda, when your relatives are visiting you, you just see them knocking on your door and they're like, hey, Trudy, I'm here at your home. Open for me, the doors have come to eat. So that's how hospitable we really are. You don't need to book an appointment 
to go and be with someone. And some people say that Kampala is actually the New York of Africa because they say that it's a city that never sleeps. You know, we have our fun, uh, we have security, we have peace. So we just have fun in every single way that we can. And uh, the other thing about us that you should know is that um, we are an agricultural and an agricultural dependent economy. And 80% of Ugandans depend on agriculture for their livelihood. I know in some countries it's the services sector, but for us, agriculture is very important. So when you talk about climate change, you talk about 80% of families being disrupted. And that means they're all going to be affected. So for us, almost every family depends on it. And as you can see, uh, we produce a lot of coffee in Uganda and the kind of farming methods that we use, as you can see in the image that I've shared with you, we still use traditional uh, methods of farming to, to produce our food. And that is the food that is able to feed all the other countries uh, around us. Uganda right now feeds Kenya, it feeds Tanzania, it even feeds Rwanda. Imagine with our methods of farming, we are feeding other countries in East Africa. My Kenyan friend already says that, Linda, Uganda is capable of feeding the entire world, but you people are just not smart in how you do your agriculture. And the other thing that is really unique about Uganda and the reason why I do what I do is uh, the fact that um, Uganda is a very youth, has a very youthful population. Uganda is the second youngest population in the entire world. And 77% of its population is under the age of 25. So I know most countries have people who are older and mature, but we are talking about a country that is largely dependent on a certain population, on a certain group of people. But then also this is a blessing for us because this is the population that we deliberately work with because we see huge potential. And then also, even if we have this age group, the fact and the sad reality of this is that 41% of these young people are neither in education or even employment or any form of work. So they're not working. They're not in any form of employment. They are just there in the community. Now, just imagine that situation, about 18 million people unemployed, not working, just in the community. We have a lot of pregnancy cases, high crime rates, and all these other things. So we have a very youthful population that can work, but it's still not being utilized very well. So allow me to share with you our climate crisis here in Uganda. According to us, our own context, what makes sense to us and the actual reality that we are facing in our country. So you can see here the, in the photo that I've shared on my slide, and that is a photo of Kampala on a rainy day. When you cannot move under the rain and you have to pay someone money to carry you on their back or to push you on a wheelbarrow yeah, because even the cars can sometimes be stuck and not everyone can afford a car to drive. So on those rainy days, you pay to be carried on someone's back, as you can see in the picture. So that's our climate reality. It's unique to us, but it is the reality. Then um, the, the thing about our weather patterns in Uganda and why it's really unique is that um, our country has experienced a temperature rise of about one about 1.3 degrees since the early 20th century, which is higher than the global average, by the way. It is really higher than the global uh, average. And what you have to know is that historically, um, Uganda enjoyed stable rainfall patterns uh, due to the tropical climate. You know, the equator, Uganda, the equator crosses uh, Uganda, and that means our climate is very stable. Uh, growing up, we just knew, even in school when we were learning, we knew that these are the months when it rains. These are the months when it doesn't rain. But today, I cannot, I cannot predict because it is not the reality of what I was taught in school. And I was in school just a few years ago, and there's this huge change. Even when I go back to the village and at home, um, it's impossible to predict uh, when when to when to plant and when not to plant. And yet when I was growing up, it was easy for my aunties and my grandmother to say, you know what, the, in this month, the rains are beginning, so let us clear the gardens. Nowadays, it's very uncertain. Uh, so the whole change in climate change uh, has disrupted rainfall pattern. And this has really, really 
led to a shortage in, in, in food, in the production of food and rains. When it rains, it really rains heavily and people's crops are destroyed. And when it doesn't rain, it also it's also very bad because then you cannot plant. So people are torn in between. In between, you know, will I survive tomorrow? Will I even make it? And very many people have gone ahead to really just abandon agriculture, and yet we need it. So the climate change has really impacted on agriculture in this country. As you can see, some people move very long distances. You see someone holding a watering can just to water their garden, but even to get water in a rain in, in such a season is very difficult. Now, this woman you see with the watering can has to move a good number of kilometers just to get the water that she has, uh, because till we get water from wells, then we really taps. And then um, food production, as you can see, someone plants their crops and then the, it really hits and it's so, it is so like sunny and you can't predict anything and everything in the garden goes bad. So that is the reality that we are facing. So um, I don't know if I shared earlier, but then we also have our mountain resort. Yes, we are <laughs> in Africa, but yes, we do have our mountain resort, which is no cap. Growing up, that was something that they taught us in school. It's a place we went to visit. But the last time I went, I couldn't recognize it because, I mean, there's almost, almost no more there on top of uh, the Renzori mountain. And uh, a lot of communities around there are, are suffering the floods. Uh, people are losing their homes. More than 200 people have been displaced, uh, which is really sad that all this is happening to the environment and the communities. So I'm obviously not going to share every bad thing that uh, happens and our climate scenario, but I'm just sharing with you to have just a picture, just a snippet in how the whole uh, climate change environment in Uganda looks like. So allow me to discuss the impact of climate change on our country and even in the rural communities that we do have. So um, what you see there is uh, <laughs> um, an image of a lady who, um, who really planted and uh, nurtured her garden. As I said, in Uganda, we rely on rain. Very few people can afford irrigation. Actually, very few people irrigate. So 80% of Uganda's workforce depends on agriculture. Just imagine a country where 80% of us depend on agriculture. And this contributes 25% to our GDP. 25% of our GDP, GDP. However, we use still local methods. Irrigation is for the lucky. And the lucky, I think, are less than 1% of the entire population that practices agriculture. So that means you have to rely on the rain. And if the rains don't turn out to be well, this is what happens. Uh, this is what you could possibly produce. Um, four years ago, I decided to also venture into farming <laughs> because everyone was encouraging, you know, you need to go you venture into farming. You need to feed your country and you need to feed people around the world. And I remember planting Sim Sim with my aunt. I think I planted on four acres. If there is one thing in Uganda, we don't lack land. We have an abundance of, of land. We have too much of it. So I was able to plant uh, four acres of, of, of uh, Sim Sim. And I was so excited, two weeks to my harvest, very ready to make my money and my breakthrough after the hard work. Um, there were heavy rains for two days. I was supposed to harvest about 20 sacks of Sim Sim, you know? But because of the rains, I didn't even harvest half a sack of Sim Sim. That, that's because of just rain that took place in two days. And that was the last time. I decided to venture in agriculture because I said, this is not really my thing. But this is a pain because that means if it's not produced, then food becomes very expensive mm -hmm. and it becomes unaffordable. So we have another challenge of water scarcity because when it really rains, the water gets to be really scarce. It is hard to get this water. Uh, for some of us, sometimes when we're in town, it's easy for us to access, but I'm talking about people in the village who access water from the wells, even those with boreholes, sometimes the water does not come out uh, in a dry season. So 
when it comes to getting water, and this is the sad reality because um, last year when we were working in the communities, we engaged a lot with the community people, and these were the significant problems that they were facing. So this is the same water that's supposed to drink. This is the same water that's supposed to cook with. This is the water that's supposed to bathe with, wash with, but there is no water. So sometimes you have to choose. Do I eat and sleep without bathing, without washing? So all those scenarios and situations are there and people are experiencing that. And the other one is obviously with climate change, given that Uganda is a tropical, um, has a tropical climate, is we malaria is a serious thing and malaria really kills. I think as a child, I was almost going to die because of malaria. But because of climate change, um, in 2022, the World Health Organization reported that Uganda had over 17,556 malaria deaths with an estimate of 2.7 million cases. Actually, this year I also had malaria and I had to treat myself. I almost thought I was going to die. So climate, when there's a change in climate change, it means it affects us. It affects the children, it affects the communities. And this is something that needs to be addressed if you are to save lives. So um, the other impact on uh, climate change is hunger and starvation. Because as I've said very many times, we depend on rain for food. When it doesn't rain, it means there is no food. It means people go hungry, people starve. And the starvation does not only affect children, it also affects adults. Uh, last year, we had so many cases of people in Karamoja dying because they had no food to eat. Um, a lot of children from Karamoja are brought to the city to be beggars on the streets. If you come to the city, you'll see them, they're beggars all over the street because at home they cannot feed themselves. But that is the sad reality. And also statistics say that 25% of the children um, under five in Uganda are said to be anemic. So again, this goes back to the food. We have the land, we have the fertile soil, it's really good, but the systems around providing the food uh, are limited. So um, yeah, so I needed to discuss with you um, the greatest contributors to the climate change in Uganda. And that is deforestation. The truth is that is deforestation. And Uganda has one of the highest risks of deforestation in the world, with an annual loss of 2.6% of our forest cover. We once had a very big forest called Mavira Forest, so, <laughs> but I think it's no longer. <laughs> yes. And then also that's because, um, as you can see in the image, most households in Uganda use firewood and charcoal to cook. We don't have alternative sources of fuel. So either it's either charcoal or firewood, and charcoal comes from firewood. And so a lot of households either use charcoal or firewood, even if the government tries to fight, fight this and put laws to fight it, it becomes very difficult because there's no alternative source of energy that people can use, especially for the rural people who make up more than 80% of the population. So this is affecting them but they're also contributing to it and they have no choice because if they don't do it, they'll not eat, but they have to eat. They really don't have a choice. So uh, that is really uh, an issue. And then also um, waste management, obviously. <laughs> waste management, I know it's everywhere in the world. And our case is also quite special in Uganda. So we have poor, first of all, our, our wastes are poorly disposed. We burn a lot of our wastes and all these release methane and other pollutants. So alone, Uganda alone generates about 600 tons of plastics daily. The government has tried to, um, to put a ban on, on plastic bags, but we still see them being produced and being sold. So we still use them. And then also what we need to know is that only 40% of the plastic waste is collected. 60% of it is uncollected. So you find it in the lakes, in the water, in the trenches. That's why when it rains, it easily floods. And also we do have a lot of solid waste that is generated in, in our country. So I've given you a picture of, um, of the situation around our climate change in Uganda, how it's impacting us, and then also 
the common causes of the climate change and the situation in our country. So I want to share with you how the youth in Uganda are taking action. The youth in Uganda have decided to make it personal and they've, they've decided that they're going to really make a huge difference and they're going to play a role in this because they are many, you know? We have 77% of Ugandans below the age of 25, and they are ready to be part of this change. They just don't know how. And that's why we come in as a Maria Tech. Uh, as you can see on the left, uh, that's a group of uh, refugees that we were working with, uh, Congolese refugees who live in an urban area. And we're working with them to tackle some of the challenges that they experience as, uh, the ex as refugees. And uh, the gentleman is a, in a cap was one of the experts we brought to guide them on how they can improve on the work that they're doing. Then on the right, we were in Gulu, a rural community, and uh, we had the issue of water, uh, the, the water scarcity that I've shared with you. So the team had developed a prototype and they went to the rural women to share with them the prototype and get some advice as to whether that will work or what they needed to do to make it really work for them to be better. And the rural women were giving them advice and telling them, no, that will not work, this will work. Can you make changes like this? And that is how we're able to, um, they're able to prototype and work around that and they're still working around it. So this is how we also making an, a contribution in the community. So um, I'm going to share with you some of the examples of solutions that our foundation has nurtured to solve community problems that are very dear to us. Um, the first one is um, this one. Uh, we do brief that care. Um, this is a story of a young boy in Lira district called uh, Haron. We went to the community in Lira Boroboro and we told them we are looking for young people that are interested in making change, but are not in school and the Community leaders helped us to identify a few people. If you can see here in the image, this is Haron during the boot camp uh, where we were doing our ideation. It was a three day boot camp. We identified some of the problems, and Haron told us he was a brick maker and they use soil to make the bricks. But then also, he shared with us how these bricks were damaging uh, the, the, the land because once land is used for making bricks, it cannot be used for agriculture. And the question he posed was, if we keep doing this to every land, shall we be left with any land for agriculture? Harun, only 17 years old, decided to work with his team to tackle the challenge of, uh, of land degradation. But then also they realized that as a young brick maker, because he was making bricks for his livelihood, they end up cutting trees for burning these bricks in order for them to be ready to be sold. So the question they had was, what alternative can we use? How can we produce bricks without damage, damaging the environment? Uh, they got to realize that we also have a lot of plastics. They said, okay, let's use the plastics. Let's make beautiful bricks. Uh, they're interlocking bricks. One time maybe we'll get a chance for Haron to share with us his work. And uh, also he was making these pla pla plastic pavers. Each brick you see here weighs about nine kilos and uh, it can make construction easy because you can construct a house in less than a week with his bricks. So um, where is her current currently at? Oh, sorry, I was not showing the image, but it's here. This is Haron. So this is, um, these are developments from Haron. We worked with an organization called Junior Achievement Uganda and uh, we were able to support Harold to participate in the Afro Innovate Challenge. Uh, Harold and his team were able to win about $9,500 and to help them continue with our work. And he used the money very well. This is, these are one of the things he invested in. He bought a truck to collect rubbish around the city. Another work that he is doing to place um, places around the city to collect the plastics. And he's also putting up his production uh, facility where they're going to be producing more of the bricks. So this is what happens when you inspire community, when you engage with them and show them what is possible. Now, Haron is inspiring very many other people to do the work that he is doing. Then the other example we have is um, Junior from West to Wealth. Um, junior, this is Junior during the boot camp in a cap, the boot camp that we did. 
And um, the challenge here was the waste from the restaurants. Uh, so um, our restaurant waste contribute about 65, 78% of the total solid waste in Uganda. We Ugandans have plenty of food. <laughs> when you go to a restaurant, it's usually so many oceans on your, on your plate. And sometimes we waste food. We don't eat everything. Those who can eat, can eat in the urban areas, but those in the rural areas still face a challenge. So um, the question was, how do we tackle this problem? Because these biodegradable wastes can lead to climate, you know, um, change. So he decided that he was going to turn those fertilizers into, <clears throat> sorry, he was going to turn those food wastes into fertilizers uh, using a process and using also, I think, black soldier flies. So now they make uh, fertilizers, they process them, and they supply them to the people in the community so that it can promote clean and organic agriculture and farming. So that is him. And then we do have fuel for cooking. Fuel free cooking. Um, you see, these are some of the boys that we were using. We were uh, during the boot camp, some of the attendants of the boot camp. Uh, there were students of a, a school called Komboni with one of our mentors. So the, the, the issue was if 80% of Ugandans cook using charcoal, what do we do for them to ensure that they stop using cooking using charcoal. So they sat with their teacher, they had an idea. And then later on, they went and worked with their teacher to build something called the solar concentrator. And um, the solar concentrator is able to cook beans in under 40 minutes. Why beans? Because in Uganda, we all eat almost beans every day. Even lunch, I had beans. But how long does it take to cook beans? Okay. <laughs> it takes about seven hours to cook beans. Now, just imagine how much charcoal and fuel and um, and and uh, the, the 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 wood is used for making um, the food. So this is clean cooking, and no firewood is being used. However, as you can see, it's too it's still very bulky. Uh, and the question was, how do we make it uh, a size that is convenient for a household to use? Um, then here we do have um, Asome, rain or shine school is on. So because of the rains that are very unpredictable, sometimes day school students miss out on school because they can't walk to school uh, when it rains because they reach when they are wet, their shoes are wet and everything is wet. And some of them sometimes are knocked down because the drivers can't see them. So we find a lot of school students missing out on school because most of them can't afford a taxi to go to school. So most of them food. Sometimes they food for two hours, sometimes three hours, sometimes one hour to go to school. So uh, Asome is a product that was developed by Helen and her team. If you see down up here during the boot camp, they were ideating with a team. So the product is just to ensure that no matter whether it rains or not, they have a waterproof backpack that they can wear and move within the rain. And then the poncho is supposed to protect them from the rain so that they reach school when they are dry and the drivers can see them from afar. That's why they were able to put the reflectors there. Uh, we were also able to support them through Junior Achievement Uganda and they were able to win some money and they're now currently going through, they're now producing bigger, more for the students. Um, here, uh, we are turning, we are turning plastic waste into fashion. Uh, we work with students of a certain school called Kololo High to um, create beautiful products out of the plastic waste. As you can see, these are bugs, beautiful bugs that they're making from plastic waste. And so they're making fashion, um, they're making things out of fashion with what is around in that community and the environment. Um, so I've shared with you a little bit about our work. And uh, our Amariatek Foundation philosophy, by the way, Amariatek means I love you so much. It's a Luo word. Uh, we gave uh, our organization the name Amariatek to... Is okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, Luo is the language spoken here in Uganda. And Amariatek um, gives every young person a chance to remind themselves how much they love themselves and also put power in their hands to say that we love where we come from, we love our community. And this is the beautiful team at Amaria Tech that makes the magic happen. <laughs> that makes the magic happen. 
I always say I'm the oldest person in Amaria Tech because everyone else is young. And every day I see the, the commitment that they put in the work to serve the fellow young people, understanding the challenges. So our philosophy is simple in how we really do work. We believe that every young person, uh, we believe that young people living within communities understand the challenges better than anyone else. We also believe that by empowering them and providing tools and resources, they can make they can take charge of local issues. We also work alongside them to transform community problems into sustainable climate smart business ideas. And these initiatives become a source of livelihood and create employment opportunities for their peers. Collaboration is key. That's why um, to uh, we achieve our greatest impact when we team up and unite with young individuals to empower them. That's why you see most of our coaches and the people we work with are young because we want them to relate. We want them to be inspired. Uh, how do we work? It's simple. We do community engagement. We don't sit in beautiful offices. We go down to the community to where they are. Uh, our boot camps take place in the community where they are. Why? Because we want to give them a chance to go in the communities, interview the people experiencing the problems in the community, prototype within the community, develop the problems, the solutions within the community with the community people, because that's where we see the change and the impact. Our work, um, we obviously do boot camps, like five day boot camps. Uh, Last year we were doing three days, but then we saw that the three days were not effective. So five day boot camps in the community. We were able to pilot that with Go Child Canada last year with refugees. So we realized five days really works. And then after that, we give them um, a small seed funding to help them get started on turning the idea into um, something that is real and tangible. And then we give them the go through mentorship of three months where we work with the community to really improve on the solution. And we later prepare them for pitches and later we guide them on how they can really implement these solutions. Our vision is a very simple vision and we wanted to share with you our vision because it is so dear to us. And um, our vision is to annually create 50 sustainable community driven ventures that address local climate challenges. The other vision is um, employment opportunities. We want to ensure that every venture grows to at least employ five of their peers. It's not just a venture, but it's also creating employment opportunities for them. Because as we told you, 41% of them are neither in education or in employment. So we want, to, we want them to find meaning out of it. And then youth empowerment, we empower young entrepreneurs with the skills and only to lead and innovate in the green economy. Um, we have a vision of building resilient communities that can adapt to and mitigate the impact of climate change. And lastly, we want to establish a network of partners and mentors to support and scale these ventures and other ventures that will come in future. So what limits our work? One, uh, some of the things that limit our work is that we work with these village people who have never left their communities. So sometimes the exposure to the different kinds of innovations is limited. But when they're exposed to different types of innovations, I do believe that they can do better. So sometimes you find that they end up coming up with similar innovations and sometimes they do not really solve the problem to a scale. So that is a challenge that we do have. And then also, um, we lack some seed funding for some of the ideas that we see are really great. Because last year we worked with an organization to do the work, but they were not supporting these people with seed funding. So more than 20 ideas that were extremely good ended up dying, which hurt us so much. Because some of these people don't even have the capital to invest in that seed, I mean, the ideas. And then also we do have a limited number of partners to work with. Yes, uh, we've worked with UNICEF a bit in guiding us on certain things, but they have limitations on the kind of organizations they work with. We've also partnered with World Child Canada, but right now they also have their own challenges and other organizations that some are just after training without looking at the bigger impact. And for us, we are after the bigger impact. And also 
limited finances to support some of the work that we do, which we know is really amazing and has a significant impact on the communities that we work in. And how can you support our beautiful work? Whoever is online. So you can support by one, collaborating with us in our programs. You can be, it can be technical support, um, whichever mentorship, you can just collaborate with us. Uh, you can partner with us to improve the quality of innovations that are developed by the different people we work with, our beneficiaries. Um, you can share opportunities with us when you see opportunities that we could benefit from, or if you know people that support a similar cause or similar work like we do, you could share those opportunities or introduce us to those people. And then you can share our work with our people, talk about our work, uh, share our work on our socials, and then uh, follow us on our so socials and share our work with the people in your circle.